everyone. Today I am so excited to be talking to author Rachel Kadish and her newest book is called The Weight of Ink and she has the hardcover right there because I, oh, look at that. I love that cover. I could just tell, I mean, even though I'm looking at it on here, I just knew it was going to look beautiful in print and I'm so happy that you have it. And I want to show everybody how big that book is because I okay. <laughs> This is, well, it's, it's my reading copy, so it's got some little papers in it, but look uh, at that book. So, it is a big book. It took me a long time to read it. <laughs> you know what? I appreciate that now because, our, do you know what NaNoWriMo is? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, People are supposed to write a novel in a month. Right. Yeah, that, that thing. <laughs> that, then, you know. Well, it's so funny because one of the authors I was interviewing was doing it. And she's like, you should really do it because I was telling her that I wanted to write my parents' story for my children, you know, because both my parents are gone. And she's like, oh, you should totally do NaNoWriMo and then you get it done in a month and it's done. And, and I was like, okay. She's like, 50,000 words. I'm like, got it. 50,000 words in a month. I can do this. And like the 7th of November, I'm like on word like 8,000. I'm like, these are not coming. This is not... <laughs> See, and I'm not even doing it for anything except for, I don't know, I just kept looking at the word count going, this is, this is not fun. This is not happening. I was like, 2,000 words a day. I can do that. 2,000 words a day. It also depends on the type of project. I mean, this novel required so much research that I had to yeah, keep going back and forth with the research. Right. And sometimes, you know, I have a novella that I wrote in six weeks and it just came so quickly. And oh, nice. This book was not like that. You notice I'm avoiding <laughs> no. it. it actually took me. Maybe we'll save that for later. But Right. Well, that's the thing. It's like when you're just writing from the top of your head that, you know, like I was just writing what I know. I wasn't doing too much research. But um, even that is really difficult. But when, you know, historical authors, there's no way. You have to do way too much prep. I mean, if you're going to sit down maybe and write it. But all the prep that goes into it, the, and this book, I cannot imagine the amount of research you had to do to write this book. You know, but I think for me, it was, um, somebody said to me, how long did you have to research before you started writing this book? And uh, and the, the book is, you know, half of it is set in 17th century London, <laughs> and not in 17th century London, but in this very specific history of this tiny, semi-hitch Jewish community. It's in the middle of the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition. These people didn't want to be outed. The history is really complex. And somebody said, how much research did you have to do before you started? But to me, it doesn't work that way because that would be like saying, I'm going to swim a mile by first doing all the breathing and then all the swimming. You know, it's a distractive process. So I had this, the moment where I, like I sort that. of researched this community and I fell in love with the community and I can tell you why and why I chose this community to set my novel in. But for the writing of the actual scenes, you know, I'd be writing a meal scene and I think, oh, wait a second, what are they wearing? What utensils are on the table in 1660? What uh, what foods are on the table? What are the table manners? You know, and I'd go and I, I, I'd have to stop the scene and go research that. And while I was researching it, I might learn some other interesting fact that would give me an idea for another scene. So it was really back and forth. Um, the actual discovery of this community for me um, came because I wanted to write, I, I've been, um, I tend to start writing when something is bothering me and I can't exactly put my finger on why or, or what I want to say about it. And the thing that was bothering me, one of the things bothering me, was that very famous question by Virginia Woolf, um, if William Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister, what would have been the fate of that? woman, a woman with that kind of capacious intelligence, you know, and, and Wolf's answer is very succinct and very depressing. It's, um, she died young. She never wrote a word. And that, I mean, that is the most likely fate for a woman of that time with the burdens on women and, um, the obligations and the restrictions on education. But I couldn't help kind of, you know, shadow boxing, like, you know, what if, what if, what would it take for a woman with that kind of mind in that time, not to be silenced. And then of course there's a the bigger question of, you know, what did it take then? What does it take now for a woman not to be defeated when everything around her is telling her to sit down and mind her manners. So I wanted to write about a woman who defies this and is able to live a life of the mind. Um, and I wanted to write a historical novel and I went looking for a time period and I stumbled across this community of Spanish and Portuguese refugees, uh, Inquisition refugees 
in Amsterdam in the 1600s. And just to tell you how ignorant I was about it, I didn't know these refugees were in Amsterdam. I didn't know anything about them, but I started reading about them. And then I started reading that, you know, Spinoza was part of that community. I didn't know anything about Spinoza. I didn't know he was Jewish. (laughs) And I learned they excommunicated him. And they didn't just give him what was the usual excommunication. It was like the slap on the wrist, you know, you're excommunicated for two weeks. That's how Jewish excommunications tend to be when, when they happened. But they gave him this absolute fire and brimstone document. And you can read it. You know, God's anger will smoke against him. Lifetime ban, lifetime ban on anyone who spoke to him. And I suddenly understood they were so frightened, these people. They were refugees. They had just escaped the Inquisition. They didn't want anybody to mess up this little perch of safety they had in Amsterdam. So when Spinoza started asking these heretical questions, they were like, we're not with him. That guy, not with him. (laughs) And I started, and you hear their fear. And then suddenly I thought, oh, my God, I know these people. Because I grew up around refugees. My mother was a refugee kid born on the run during World War II. My parents, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And I recognized the fear and this fierce, beautiful determination to rebuild. Not the same issues, but similar. So I was hooked. I just fell in love with this community. And then I found out that some of them went to London to try to sort of provide Jewish education to this tiny Jewish community in London that was hidden. And I thought, okay, that's where I want to set my story of a woman who breaks rules and tries to live a life of the mind. So I wrote, I came up with this character, Esther Velasquez, who scribes for a, who ends up writing for a blind rabbi because he's blind. He needs someone to write and read for him, but he doesn't know what she's actually reading or writing. And she's working with him in London in the household, which is a role that a woman would not normally have. And that's where the story started for me. And then it's, you know, it's the two layer thing where documents are found in contemporary London. They're 350 years old. You know, who wrote them? They say some radical things. They don't seem to make sense. And so, you know, the documents that Esther left behind are found by another woman historian 350 years later. I love that. As a reader, like, I love that concept so much. Like, I want to stumble upon documents. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm such a history buff and it's like, can you imagine getting docu? Like I love the concept of that and the story and how it unfolds. And just for people to know, like I don't go searching for 500 page books. That's not my gig. Okay. Because I read a lot of books and I got to read a lot of, a a lot of books. And, but when I started, I found you, I don't even know. Somebody was like, you have to read this book because I get recommendations all the time. Okay. So that's nice to know. But somebody was like, read this book. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't know if I have time. I don't know if I can do it. You know? And then I told you I do whisper sync with Kindle and audio. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this book. I'm going to do it. And I have to tell you that the one thing I've learned about reading books that are really long is that you have more time to get invested in these characters. By the end of the book, I was actually sad <laughs> that it was over because I don't know. I, I'm all for a 300 page book because I get 350. I can get it done right away. But there's something about that extra 150 to 200 pages that by the end of that, you're like, I can't believe I'm saying this because it's not like, oh my God, I did it. It's like, oh, it's over. It's, it, I don't want it to be over. And, and your book did that for me. And I, that's why I love telling people, um, you know, that like, get it, like, don't let it, don't let it intimidate you because a lot of people are intimidated by that. I mean, not only was that hard for you to write, but as readers, we look at that book and we're like, I I don't, I don't have time. (laughs) I'm even carrying it around when I go to give readings now, I'm carrying it around my suitcase. (laughs) I do, but, but thank you for saying that because I feel like, um, I mean, this book, I write things that are shorter. This book had to be that long with the, the intricacy of the story and it ends up being like a mystery to solve. But I knew that I was asking a lot of the reader. And so I, I mean, I was aware of that the whole time, which is part of why I decided, okay, I'm really going to go for it. I'm going to tell a big story. And right. you know, this story is actually, it's going to have plot because I want, um, my idea was that if you invest that much in learning the history, that the, the book should feel like that moment in the fireworks show as you get toward the end where you think, oh, wow, that was the finale. Oh, wait, no, that wasn't the finale. Wait, there, you know, there's more. I wanted yes. to tell a big story um, yes. and to try to reward the investment and the work that the reader would put in to learn that history. And I have to say full credit to my agent and my editor because everybody's always leery about, you know, well, in the age of Twitter, oh, will yeah. he be so willing to read, to really invest in, and read a book that, you know, it's, it's not a snack. It's a seven course meal. Yes. Um, and, uh, and they, they took the leap and went, went there with me and I'm grateful to them. 
Yeah, because I've heard to it. Right, and I've heard authors say that a lot of their publicists will be like, "Okay, no way, you have to, you know, cut a hundred pages off of this somehow, or you know, whatever." But I'm, I'm so happy you didn't. And I have to tell you, and you know, I know that I'm very emotional time of my life, you know, but I would read, I would be reading on the couch and I would burst into tears at the end of a chapter. Like you would have me and the emotion, like just as different things are being found, you know, because they're trying to put a puzzle together and as their aha moments, I'm like, oh, it would catch my breath. Okay. Like I was right there with them discovering what they were discovering. And, oh, um, you know, my children think I'm crazy because they're always, they're like, how do you get that emotional about a book? I'm like, well, this is why I do this because I do get emotional, but you had me there. You had me right in there and discovering everything with them. And I loved Helen's backstory, loved her backstory. I mean, that was just, I don't know. It was like one of my favorite parts. Wow. I love learning the history, but her, her history was also important. And, you know, <sighs> and then right. it ended. <laughs> And then it ended, Rachel. <laughs> I miss the characters now, but I think part of it for me also, and this is going to sound crazy, but I didn't outline the book in advance. I didn't plan it because, oh. yeah, I know, it's with it, that intricate a plot. So I have a lot of cleanup to do later. But, but the reason I don't is that um, for me, I have to see who the characters are. Like to, to me, um, uh, and I also teach writing, so this is often how I teach about, I, I talk about plot. For me, plot is... Characters plus pressure equals plot, right? Different different right. people respond to characters differently. So if you put, you know, the two of us or and you know, five hundred different people each in the same situation under the same pressures, we would react differently, and a different plot would come out of it. Yeah. So yeah. I really like I need to see who the people are and what pressures they're under, and then what would they do? Oh, that's what they would do. Okay. And so for me, it's you know, I was on the edge of my seat because it's a journey of discovery for yeah. me. Um, and I also wrote it in this order so I'd have you know Helen and Aaron are reading these documents. Helen and Aaron can't stand each other, especially right. in the beginning. So that was <laughs> fun. So fun. Fun. Tension, tension that is horrible to live through in real life <laughs> is really fun on the page. Yes. So, um, and. Then they find something, you know, maybe there's a, a phrase in Latin in the margins of the document. And um, this doesn't make any sense. Who would have known this? Who would have been able to write this phrase in Latin on the edge of a you know, Hebrew document? I don't know. So I would go to the 17th century and work on Esther's story. And, okay, why did she know this phrase in Latin? And, why, you know, and I'd figure that out. And then I'd go back. So it was really improvisational. Uh, is it, was it your favorite book to have written? So um, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I spent so much time, you know, like, like with anything in life, you get back what you put in. I spent so much time learning this world and then also learning not just the major characters, but the minor ones. So, um, there's Rivka, the, you know, the housekeeper. Well, there was, I knew she was there because I knew there was a housekeeper in the house and also because she's a, a European Jew, an Eastern European Jew, an Ashkenazic Jew. And at that time, the power within the European Jewish community was was really the Sephardic Jews, the Portuguese Spanish Jews were wealthy. They looked down on those Polish Jews. Um, they didn't agree to be buried in the same cemeteries. I mean, it was a whole thing. And so I, she was in there and I was playing with the power dynamics of that. But, you know, as time went on, this character who was a minor character became more important. Like she was a center of gravity for me. Every time she came into the scene, I was like, oh, Rivka's there. And by the end of the book, she really surprised me. There was a moment where I knew that this big ordeal had just happened. I'm trying not to give any spoilers. We do not and give spoilers. We do uh, not. That's why I always talk around everything. <laughs> and I thought, Rivka has to say something shocking here. And what's it going to be? And then I wrote the line. I was like, oh, my God, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it made me rethink her whole character. So the, to me, that's the payoff for me of, of really investing a lot in the whole world building. Yeah. I mean, I love how you wove Shakespeare in it. Mm -hmm. I love that, you know, I, I don't know. I love that part of it. And I'm, I'm not even a huge, I, it's not like I know a lot about it, but I loved how it kind of just got woven into the story, into their story. And, um, yeah, the ending, like I said, I, I didn't want it to end. It had to end, but, <laughs> but this, this book is not a movie. Like I always, I always tell people, you know, like, Oh, this is such a great movie. This is not a movie. This is like, um, you know, they're, you know, how PBS right now or even Netflix are doing these like series where they do like a full season or two of a story. Like to me, that's what, this is what I would watch. You know, it's like, yeah, that because that's how you learn that time. I mean, I'm all on the crown and all, you know, Victoria and all that stuff because you get to learn the history behind it in a very real way. 
there's no way to get this into a two hour movie. Like that's just impossible. I would, you know, I would be like, no, you're cutting parts out. Stop cutting parts out. I would want the whole thing there. So, you know, for anybody listening, that's my thoughts. <laughs> Any adaptation, I'm happy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I saw, like, how long, how long did this book take you to write? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. How long? So, all right. <laughs> I want to preface this by saying that I had, had, they're no longer young children, but I had young children when I started. I was actually pregnant okay. with my son. I was pregnant with my son when I started this book. He is 12. Okay. Um, so it took me really 12 years. Uh, I, in that time I wrote a lot of short stories and essays and I, um, and an event. Oh, sorry. My dog. Is, uh, That's okay. I have a dog too. I, it happens. Okay. Um, I love animals. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but I think, you know, like my life, like, well, I, this book is about what it took for a woman to persist, right? right. Young- well, no, exactly. Um, and I had an enormous amount of research, and not just the research, but you know, figuring out the 17th century language. I had to learn how philosophers think. I don't have a philosophy yes, brain. The way, okay, so I'm listening to this. I, I wanted to give this woman credit. Her name is Corey James. She did the audio for you. I don't know if you got to pick her or have any choice, but the way she was talking, you know, when I was when I was listening to her, and I was like, how did Rachel write this? Like I could hear it in her voice that that's the way they spoke and it sounded so natural. I was like, how did she know that? How did you know the language when you were doing, you know, that, that part is just crazy to me. And she did a a fabulous job. I knew where she was, which is something to say when you have, when you're working with different time periods, because some of these off, some of these, um, audiobook narrators, you can't really tell. You're like, wait, where am I? Or I'm looking, you know, but her, I could definitely tell where I was. I could tell what character it was. She was amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, I um, I did a couple things with the research. One with the language for 17th century. I realized I didn't, I couldn't and didn't want to write the way they actually spoke in the 17th century because that sentence structure is very, very hard for us now and people right. wouldn't have been able to read it. So I decided what I was going to do was use a slightly more modern sentence structure, but I, my rule for myself was that when I was in the 17th century, I couldn't use any word that wasn't in use then. And it's the nerdiest thing in the world, but if you look on Merriam-Webster online, for every single word in the dictionary, it says first known use. So, for example, when Esther is accompanying Mary around London, she's her chaperone, but the first known use for chaperone, that word appears in the mid-1700s, so I couldn't use it. So I refer to her only as her companion or her, her duenna. And I did that across the board with with everything in the 17th century, if I wasn't sure, I'm sure I made some mistakes, but if I wasn't sure about a word, I looked it up. And my hope was that, that like tiny little shifting of the language would add a flavor that you'd be able to pick up on. So that it would be an an easy, more modern sentence structure, but with that flavor of the 17th century. So I did that. And with the philosophy, I remember, I mean, I, I, philosophy, philosophy scares me. I, um, it's not my natural way of thinking. I think of philosophers as people who are able to look over all our heads, over our messy day-to-day realities, and look straight to these larger truths. And I think of novelists as people who get to the larger truth through looking at our messy day-to-day realities. Like, that's how we do it. Yes. And when I would try to read, and I had to learn about Spinoza and about the Enlightenment, and I would try to read it at first, and you know those um, Newton's cradles with little silver balls? Yeah. So that's how my brain was. Like, I would, you know, I could get one sentence at a time. I really understand this sentence of philosophy, you know. And I would get that sentence, and it would knock out the prior one, you know, that I, I thought I understood. I couldn't, I, and I emailed my agent at one point, and I said, I don't know if this reference will mean anything to you, but I said, I am the million vanilla of metaphysics. I'm lip syncing it. I just, I can't. Um, And then I kept trying and trying at a certain point, this massive book I'd been trying to read that I was convinced wasn't in English. Suddenly it was in English because I'd spent enough time and I spent the time learning how people speak this way and how Esther would speak. Um, But that whole process, you know, over 12 years, there were time, you know, there were snow days and there were sick days and there were, you know, the babysitter would flake out and I would have weeks just where I couldn't concentrate, couldn't work. And, um, there's a quote from John Gardner who said that a novel, not sorry, a novel should be a vivid and continuous dream. And I used to just feel like, how am I supposed to have a vivid and continuous dream when I'm, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm the mother of young kids. And I, you know, I, I, for some crazy reason, I picked this really ambitious project until one day it was like the light bulb went off and I said, Oh, the vivid and continuous dream belongs to the reader. 
that's for the reader to enjoy. My job is to have a very interrupted, you know, my, my interrupted life, but I, I keep coming back and I don't give up. I persist <laughs> and bit by bit, I can build this vivid and continuous dream for someone else to have. So I think, you know, I was writing about the difficulties women face in trying to live a life of the mind. And my life is so much easier now <laughs> than women's were in the past. But I thought, okay, so you just don't give up. You keep going. Right. I know we think that our lives are hard. Okay, you know, because we've got so much to do, so you know, all the time. And but think about with technology and I mean, our lives are not that hard. You know? But but you're so inspiring to me because when I was raising my children, um, my youngest is 14, so he's not quite finished yet. But like I always thought that was what I was doing. Like it was like that was what I did. Okay. But I always tell my daughters who are in their 20s and my one daughter has two small boys and I'm like, make sure you have something. Make sure you have something outside because I look back and think, I didn't have anything for me for, you know, that was fun. Like when you put them to bed, when you have a nap time, when you have, you know, like it's so important to have something. And, and when I talk to authors like you who are able to write and raise small children and, and still show up, I'm like, I just wish I would have known I could have you know, what's possible. And so I, you know, I was really inspired to read that, you know, your, your mom, you were raising your kids and you're writing this humongous journey of a book. I mean, you know, and, and how much you must have learned. I mean, I bet it's invaluable what you learned writing this book. Yes. Yes. I feel, you know, I mean, I've always been in love with history. I've always loved that sense that you could, you know, what we can learn from other time periods. And because I grew up with people who had lived these crazy histories, it was just, I was always aware that our lives right now are being shaped all the time by histories that we're not even aware of or thinking about. So I felt so lucky to do it. Oh. So what, okay, I know you're, you're book touring when you can and you're, you know, but do you have a plan for like what's next? I mean, or do you finish this kind of a book and be like, I'm taking a year off, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> right, oh, vacation would be nice. Um, <laughs> you know, I have, I have some ideas, but you know, like I said before, I gotta get in there and see what happens. So I'm, um, I'm superstitious about saying what they are in case I you know, say, yes, I have this idea, and then I try to do it and it all vanishes. But, um, you know, one thing with this book is that I worked on it for so long that I'm eager to do other things. Yeah. You know, I'm to go eager somewhere to... else with, yeah, to do something completely different. Right. You know, that would be awesome. I mean, I love the way you wrote. I mean, I can't even express it enough to everybody. Like, your writing is amazing. You sucked me in. Whether I was listening or reading, I was so sucked into the story that, you know, I'm so grateful that I read it. And you know, your reviews are amazing. I never read reviews. I always just go for the book. I, you know, I get, I get recommendations, but I don't go to Amazon and read. And so today I did, I went on Amazon. I was like, oh my God, look at what, I mean, people are loving this book. So you must be thrilled. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my dog is thrilled. <laughs> your dog is thrilled. And I feel incredibly lucky and grateful that readers are willing to um, enter all that history and to, yeah. you know, to walk those 17th century streets with those characters. That's yes. Absolutely. Well, can you hold it up one more time? I'm going to have all of Rachel's links underneath this video so you can find her. Look at that beautiful cover. Are the pages on the side beveled? Um, that's always my interest in books is like if they're, they are kind of, right? Yeah. I like it. Okay. Wait, does that mean curve? Oh, What's oh that? no. Yeah. You know when they're like, no? They oh, are. Well, it's hard to tell they're, from the picture. It's sort of a modern uh, thing, but... um. But it was, I love what they did with the cover. Um, it was pretty funny. Um, uh, there's a, a story behind the cover design, but I don't know if we have. If we no, have. go ahead. I, I wanted to see everybody to see that in between, because he can't see that. I can see it on my, that there's writing there, you know, in between, like, you can right. see the Right, that's writing. what the story is about. Let me see if I, oh my God. My, see my that's dog okay. Is, no worries. Uh, but yeah, there's writing and it's very faint, but you can tell that there's. Right writing on that. So go ahead, tell me the story behind the cover. I love covers. My dog, <laughs> My dog is named Henry, which is short for Henry David Thoreau. And he gets called his phone and then he does something bad. So then I can say, like, Henry David Thoreau, we don't drink out of the toilet. And then it makes me laugh. So then That is that. really funny. <laughs> and so whatever we name him, his full name has to make me laugh because you only use a full name and they are in trouble. That's right. So there's this background text, and I don't know if it shows through. Oh, there through. we go. I just saw it. Yes. Okay. So when I put it close like that. Yes. So 
this background text, and they did this beautiful thing where the background text bleeds through the color, the main yes. words. So you can see ink coming through other ink. Perfect cover. So they showed me the design, and I was like, this is beautiful. I just have one question. What is that background text? Because, you know, you put words on the right. cover of my book. It looks, you know, I don't know. I thought I saw an umlaut. It looks like, you know, very old writing, centuries old. But I just want to know what it is. So it's not something that's going to, you know, embarrass all of us. Right. And so, um, you know, and you know, in my book, there's also this cultural divide between the historians who right. care very much about the meaning of a document and the uh, document conservation people who care about the documents as physical objects. Right. So I felt like I was almost in the book because the art department, their job is to make a beautiful design, and they did. And I was here saying, okay, you know, what does it say? <laughs> you know, while to get an answer back, I got an answer back from the art department who made this beautiful thing, and they said, um, well, it, it was on Google Image Bank and of some kind, and I don't know how these things work, but the caption says, Latin writing on 17th century paper. So, okay, something in Latin, but language latin is a language people read i don't read it but some people do right you know what I mean so i thought okay i know i'm the the word nerd here who you know so let me take care of this so i contacted someone at boston college which is a jesuit university and i said can you put me in touch with a latin tutor i sent them this five minutes later i get back this isn't latin oh. uh, and then it you know might be german so i send it to a german scholar no it's not german it might be an old scandinavian language it might be old danish swedish whatever so i start going around to everyone i know who has any connection to any of these languages my neighbor sent it to somebody at the goethe institute who said this is german but it's a dialect of german it's a form of german writing that hasn't been used in centuries so I found an expert at Brandeis University who reads this old form of German, who said it, who had to translate it letter by letter, and I could only budget it for two hours of translation time. She couldn't even go word by word. It was letter by letter. So within the time I could budget for, she couldn't translate the whole thing. But what she got is, it is so it's this old German. It's from probably before, like probably 1500s or earlier. It um, refers to territories in central Germany, and it says something like, you know, because we were wronged and our territories were taken from us, we are entitled to do, you know, whatever, whatever. I didn't get the, the whole thing. I got enough to know that it's not something, first of all, it's not something that's, I think, going to embarrass us, but also it's a form of German writing that even people who speak German can't, you know, modern German can't read, so I figured we're safe. But what I loved is that here we are, and it's like being right in the book again. I mean, here's a piece of history. It's floating around. Right. It's on some Google image bank. It's mislabeled. It's misattributed. It's a piece of history just floating into our lives, and we have no idea. So I, I finally contacted the publisher, and I said, okay, and I did all my research, and here's what it is. And <laughs> they're sort of like, okay, is that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> to me by now, they know I'm just this, you know, like I'm – <laughs> very yes. nerdy about all this stuff but I was like yes I, I kind of love it I love the fact that this misattributed document is on the front Ends cover up on the cover I know because when I saw it on here and I don't think any, anybody yeah, no, that's that? that's audiobook cover yeah which yeah, is very audio similar book, yeah this is the audiobook because I can't really tell it on my Kindle one but the audio one I can see it and I was like wait is this Latin because I know a mm -hmm. little Latin and then I'm like, it doesn't look like Latin, but I was, I'm so weird that of course I'm like looking to see if it means something. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I have the kindred spirit here. Yes. Yes. Cause I'm that weird. I'm like, wait, does it say something from the book? Is that what it, you know, is there a clue here or something? But you know, anyway, so that's kind of funny. So maybe there are other people out there like us who are looking at that and now they know what it is. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Well, thank you so thank much, you so Rachel. Much. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. It was really fun meeting you. It was really fun. I am so happy I got to read your book. I'm thrilled. You know, it changed me. I, I, I went through all the emotions with it. Everything I wanted in a book is in that book. So I'm, I'm really pleased. And um, I can't wait to see what you do next. Please keep in touch. Let me know. We can chat again. <laughs> Good luck with everything. All, the, all of Rachel's things will be listed on here. Amazon links. Facebook or anything she's on, it'll be there. So um, best of luck to you and, and have a happy holiday. Oh, you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.